Hello, I'm Bob McMaster. Welcome to this, the first in a series of short Zoom casts on the life and legacy of Edward Hitchcock. This one entitled Edward Hitchcock and the Rise of American Geology. In the early 19th century, geology was largely a European discipline. The foremost geologists of that time were these two men, James Hutton and Abraham Gottlob Werner. Hutton was a Scotsman, Werner a German. They were brilliant men, but they saw the world through a European lens. In fact, neither man ever traveled outside of Europe. One of the first scientists to focus on American geology was this man, William McClure, who drew this geological map of North America in 1809. He is sometimes referred to as the father of American geology, although he was actually a native of Scotland. But he did spend the last 40 or so years of his life in America. In the first few decades of the 19th century, a new generation of American geologists would appear, men familiar with the North American continent and devoted to expanding the understanding of its history. Edward Hitchcock grew up in Deerfield, Massachusetts, a town that lay at the confluence of two great rivers, the Connecticut and the Deerfield. Those rivers carried millions of tons of sediment downstream from northern New England every year. And when they rose above their banks, as they often did in Deerfield, they deposited new sediment that made the town's soil some of the richest in New England. We may well imagine how a young boy with a curious mind and an acute eye might develop an interest in geology, growing up with a living laboratory of geological processes right outside his door. In 1825, at the age of 32, Hitchcock was appointed professor of natural history and chemistry at Amherst College, a position he would hold for nearly 40 years. He had no earned college degree, but had attended Yale informally for just a few months, sitting in on the geology lectures of Benjamin Silliman. Nevertheless, young Hitchcock had already earned a reputation as a geologist, having published nearly 30 papers on the subject in scholarly journals of that time. Like many scientists of his day, Hitchcock was also an ordained minister, a Calvinist of the most orthodox stripe, and as we shall see, his religious sentiments influenced his geological thinking, at least for a time. In his first lecture at Amherst College, Professor Hitchcock warned his students that the discipline of geology was rife with theories such as Neptunism, Plutonism, and Uniformitarianism. Many geology texts of his day began with an explanation of those major systems of thought, but not Professor Hitchcock. He preferred to reverse the, that order, beginning with accounts of rocks and rock formations themselves, and only toward the end of the course, introducing those competing theories. Edward Hitchcock was, he often asserted, a man of facts, not of theories and grandiose hypotheses. So induction, the gathering of data before drawing conclusions, was his approach to geology and to all his intellectual pursuits. Hitchcock's geological fame was advanced still further when in 1830 he was appointed as the first state geologist of Massachusetts. He had written a letter to Governor Levi Lincoln suggesting that the state carry out a geological survey. The governor must have liked the idea. Within a month, he sent it along to the legislature. It had been enacted and Hitchcock himself had been appointed to carry out the project. This was an enormous undertaking for Hitchcock. After all, he already had a full-time job, a growing family, and a range of health problems. Here you see the route he followed in just the first season of field work, covering 1,600 miles in 56 days, all in a horse-drawn wagon. He continued that survey for three more years, traveling a total of more than 3,000 miles and visiting 266 cities and towns in Massachusetts and adjacent states, recording over 400 pages of notes and collecting several thousand rock and mineral specimens. 
One goal of the uh, geological survey was to draw a detailed geological map of Massachusetts. This he did, and it was the first detailed geological map ever created for any state. It compares very favorable with modern day maps, keeping in mind that the technology available to Hitchcock was nothing more than a geologist's hammer for breaking off mineral samples. Another goal of the project was economic, to find and describe new mineral resources that might be of economic value in the state. I think on balance that this part of his work was not too fruitful. For one thing, Massachusetts' two major mineral resources had already been discovered and exploited, granite in the east and limestone in the west. Hitchcock wrote in his final report, the anthracite of Rhode Island and even that of Worcester will be considered by posterity, if not by the present generation, as a treasure of great value. Well, I think it is safe to say that no one ever made a dollar on Massachusetts or Rhode Island coal. There's coal, all right, but of inferior quality and not marketable. Hitchcock also wrote of the possibility of gold in the Bay State. He found some gold nuggets in Talco Slate in Somerset, Vermont in 1832 and wrote in his report, how far south the gold may be found remains to be shown. May we not expect to find it near the Holly, Massachusetts mine of iron since this is in Talco Slate? Well, I doubt that any gold was ever discovered in Holly, Massachusetts. But there were some very important results from Hitchcock's geological survey. Like most scientists of his time, Hitchcock saw much of the surface geology he observed as diluvial, that is, as a result of a flood, in particular, the great flood of Genesis, the flood of Noah and his ark. But during his survey, he began to doubt that any flood could be responsible for what he observed. Two phenomena in particular struck his interest throughout Massachusetts and New England, diluvial grooves, what we would call glacial striae today, and large boulders far from their source, what we would call glacial erratics today. He found those boulders particularly interesting and perplexing. For one thing, many were huge, like this one in Whitingham, Vermont, that he named the Green Mountain Giant. I visited that very boulder, boulder not long ago, and as you can see, it is massive. He was further perplexed in the Berkshires by many trains of boulders such as these that stretch across Richmond and Stockbridge. <clears throat> this train consisted of hundreds, perhaps thousands of large boulders that originated on a ridge just over the uh, line, state line in New York, but were strewn along a path 15 or, uh, miles or so to the southeast, ending in Great Barrington. He wrote in his report in 1833, making every allowance for the reduction of gravity of these boulders when in water, I cannot, I confess, I cannot conceive how such a work could have been effected by this agency. Evidence of this sort caused Hitchcock to doubt that any flood, no matter how great, could have been the cause of those boulders and those glacial furrows. Just a few years later, this man, Louis Agassiz, published his landmark work on continental glaciation. And when he did, Edward Hitchcock was among the first American geologists to publicly adopt that theory. Hitchcock's geological survey and his published reports were well received by scientists and public officials nationwide. More than a dozen states underwrote their own surveys in the next two decades using Hitchcock's methods and reports as models. In the course of his geological survey, Hitchcock came to know a number of other American geologists. And in 1840, a group of some 20 assembled in Philadelphia and formed the Association of American Geologists. Hitchcock was elected the first chairman and delivered the keynote address at the first and second meetings. A few years later, that organization was renamed the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the nation's foremost professional scientific association to this day. By 1840, Hitchcock had also made a name for himself in the field of paleontology. In 1835, he began studying the tracks of ancient animals preserved in sandstone, 
what he referred to as fossil foot, footmarks. He would publish nearly two dozen scientific papers on those footmarks over the next 25 years. And while his assertion that they were most likely formed by ancient birds met with some scorn and ridicule in his day and even into the 20th century, today we know that those tracks were made by dinosaurs, the ancestors of modern day birds. I will have more to say about Hitchcock's fossil footmarks in a subsequent Zoomcast. 1840 was also the year in which Hitchcock published the first edition of a college text entitled Elementary Geology. By then he had been teaching geology at Amherst for 15 years. While his lectures were largely based on his research, he had been using texts by eminent European ge geologists, Sir Charles Lyell, Henry de la Beche, and Robert Bakewell. But Hitchcock was determined to publish a truly American text, one that reflected his own experiences his own perspective on geology. Elementary geology quickly became the standard text for geology in American colleges. It went through 31 editions over the next 34 years. Hitchcock included much new material on Agassiz's glacial theory and his own work on the fossil footmarks. The frontispiece was an illustration entitled Paleonto Paleontological Chart that refer, uh, revealed a great deal about Hitchcock's evolving concept of the relationships among living things. Edward Hitchcock was, as he often asserted, a man of facts. He resisted the temptation to jump on every bandwagon to adopt radical new theories without the evidence to support them. His geological surveys of Massachusetts and Vermont armed him with vast data on the history of the earth. Based on that information, he guided American geology to many revolutionary new paradigms in his lifetime on subjects as diverse as glacial geology, metamorphism, and paleontology. Just a few years before his death, a new work revolutionized our understanding of the development of life on Earth, On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. Not surprisingly, Edward Hitchcock was at first highly critical of Darwin's theories, both on religious and on scientific grounds. But in the last year of his life, he published an important paper in a theological journal. He first articulated his religious reservations with Dar Darwinism, but then the paper seemed to pivot dramatically. He wrote, but after all, the real question is not whether these hypotheses accord with our religious views, but whether they are true. He seemed to leave the door open for Darwinism when he wrote, perhaps this unknown law will by and by be discovered as many new laws have been to explain phenomena once supposed to be miraculous because anomalous and inexplicable. Ever the empiricist, the venerable professor from Amherst could not rule out the possibility that species might in fact evolve. Had he long, lived long enough to see additional evidence for Darwin's theories, the indefatigable Edward Hitchcock might well have found a way to accept them. In future Zoomcasts, I will explore other topics um, in, about Edward Hitchcock's life and legacy, including his research on the fossil footmarks and his efforts to convince other clergy, scientists, and the general public that science and religion need not be adversaries. For many more insights on the man and um, the book, uh, I invite you to read my book, All the Light Here Comes From Above, The Life and Legacy of Edward Hitch Hitchcock. You might also enjoy visiting my website, www.edwardhitchcock.com, for additional information on the man and the book. Thank you very much for joining me today.